G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for the first round review of the 2022 season. Uh, didn't plan on making a regular video like this this year. Obviously, I'm going to be a little bit time strapped with work uh, producing content this year that I thought maybe a small round review week to week could be kind of a sustainable thing. Honestly, I thought the opening round of this season has been uh, really entertaining actually. A pretty good standard of football that I wasn't expecting. Fairly high scoring as well. I know that's kind of typical of round ones in the past. That that being said, there was plenty to like. I did actually get to watch a lot of football this weekend, which I'm stoked about. So I thought I'd come up with a little short casual video where I sort of go through each game as it happened and not really simply just sort of spew the facts about what happened, but more or less give you a short reaction to any talking points that I think came out of the game. Full disclosure, if I have not watched a game, I'm going to be honest with you, there's going to be no bullshit. I'm not going to try and give you a description of a game that I didn't watch, but I figure giving a video like this a crack week to week is better than nothing. So hopefully some sense gets made out of it. As always guys, if you're enjoying the videos, I would appreciate if you could subscribe to the channel if you're getting something out of it and also consider checking out the sponsors of all of our videos, manscaped.com. You can get 20% off and free shipping on their products, so go check out the link in the description. But anyway, let's just crack into it, starting with uh, the Wednesday night fixture, the grand final replay, Melbourne versus the Western Bulldogs. I did get to watch most of this game, thankfully. Honestly, I don't know what the talking points are really out of that game. I think everyone was kind of, it was quite a refreshing change to see a grand final replay at the season an opener. It's something that people have been calling for for years and it really did give the game some extra meaning as well. So as you'd expect, the standard of the game was fairly high. Obviously it's round one and I did notice across the league there was a lot of final quarter round one fatigue. I think that was pretty common across the board and it certainly did occur in the opening game of the season as well. In terms of the trends of the game, it did reflect the grand final quite remarkably actually. The Demons kicked like Four of the first five goals, I think. Then the Dogs got an eight or nine point lead at half time before the Demons ultimately took control of the game. Didn't quite run away with it to the same extent, obviously, only winning by about four or five goals in the end. But what was similar was Christian Petrarca having a day out. I think he collected close to 40 touches. It was an entertaining game. You can't read too much into round one, but you did get the feel you were watching two very good teams once again. And there's nothing to suggest Melbourne aren't still the benchmark of the competition. So your typical guys like McRae was good. I think he had 39 touches. Petrarca, as I said, Bailey Smith, Bob up for plenty of the footy as well. So not really too many surprises. What the biggest takeaway was, Melbourne notched a, a win in what is pretty much considered an eight-point game because you'd expect both of these sides will go deep in September. Carlton then played Richmond, uh, a game that we live-streamed, so uh, you got plenty of our thoughts on that particular game. I said before the game that this is uh, kind of a measuring stick, at least for Carlton, these games each year, see how they measure up on the best team in the comp, Richmond, or so they have been considered for the last, you know, best part of half a decade. For the Blues, ultimately, they would notch their first round one win over Richmond in something like 10 years or something and remarkably it's their first win inside the first three rounds for almost that time frame as well. Other than notching the four wins I think the most pleasing elements would be Paddy Cripps having a return to form with three goals and 30 touches. If you base that and extrapolate his pre-season form it looks like he could be returning to his best which is a huge factor in Carlton pushing for finals this year and then Chera also I think he had 30 and a goal. Doherty was amazing on his return with 28 and a goal and Hewitt was also there with 28 touches as well. He might even kick the goal himself so for once it's a refreshing change for Carlton where they can look at their new recruits and they can see immediate impact. So looking back on this game, this could be seen as a bit of a changing of the guard as Carlton may officially be better than Richmond. Again, it's too early to say. For the Tigers, uh, they didn't really have too many strong contributors. They've obviously always been a system team, so it's not uncommon for you know their best players to not have too many touches, but someone like Cochin, 14 touches with 92 minutes. Dusty had the most possessions on the ground with 21 and a goal. And as I said, that's not massively uncommon for them, but one thing I did highlight pre season was probably their depth in particular in the midfield so I know that Prestia going down early didn't help but fingers crossed that he's okay but if Richmond's underbelly is kind of exposed this year then they might find it tough going for a lot of this year. St Kilda then played Richmond and uh, this game surprised me with the quality of football uh, to, the, to this point we'd had three games and I thought all the quality of the games were pretty good in particular Collingwood at times absolutely looked like a finals contender. Now I shouldn't make big calls after round one so I'm not going to fall into the trap of that but pre-season I did predict the Pies to actually win the wooden spoon and although it's round one I feel very very confident now that I got that absolutely wrong. I played with a really really good intensity I think it was their pressure in particular and even looking at the best 22 of those games I looked at it and I was like on paper St Kilda should be much stronger here Collingwood playing a very very young lineup I commented they were top heavy their stars were fantastic but other than that carrying a lot of young guys either teenagers or not far out of their teenage years so for them to put up the team performance that they did was very very impressive. 
Now, again, I'm not going to make any big calls on how far they can go this year, but to me, they don't look anything resembling a wooden spoon team. So if they have a bit of luck on the injury front, and I know it's a COVID year, anything could happen, there's a good chance they will be closer to 8th than they will 18th. St Kilda, on the other hand, uh, that's a bad loss, to be honest with them, for a team that you know should be aiming for finals for their list position at the moment. I thought they were really good in flashes, had their moments, but ultimately just went to sleep for large periods of the game and fought back really hard. I think they got in front at one point, but ultimately Collingwood were the better team on the night and to good when it mattered. Geelong then played Essendon and I must admit I didn't catch much of this game a little bit on the radio but uh, I must say there's a little bit of satisfaction from the fact that Geelong have once again just annihilated the haters. I know Essendon were missing players I think both sides were missing players to be fair but Essendon particularly in that forward half I think lack of scoring power um, was a huge blow to them in this game. That being said the debut of uh, is that Nick Martin from Zubiaco five goals 27 touches absolutely unreal. I can't wait for all the West Australian media to pick apart the Eagles for not picking him up. But for me, the major talking point of that game really is probably the fact that Geelong have once again, you know, flexed some muscle and I think they are very, very dangerous. I'm waiting to see what the go is with Jeremy Cameron because that's a big out if he's injured, but still a very, very strong team. Then you had the Sydney Derby or whatever the hell it's called these days, GWS and Sydney. And again, I thought this game was a really, really high standard. I watched it and it looked again like two teams that you'd expect to play finals. And in fact, they did play finals against each other last year, but ultimately Sydney got the job done. Uh, I tipped that correctly. Thought both sides moved the ball well. Uh, Taranto was a beast for the Giants. I was watching him and uh, a very, very important pillar for them. Sydney probably had a more even spread of contributors, but I did my top 20 AFL players uh, last Last week and I got a comment from someone saying they couldn't believe I didn't have any Swans players namely Mills, Parker or Heaney I think it was in my top 20 and when I watched that I thought that's a really good point. Watching that game, I couldn't help but kick myself. Luke Parker is probably close to the top 10, at least, players in the competition. What the hell was I thinking? Kick five goals, had 20-odd touches, and he's an absolute match winner. If I could do that video again, I would have him a lot higher in the rankings. But another eight-point game in theory for the Swans, uh, beating the Giants, the two sides that should, in my opinion, go close to the eight, if not make it. So don't underrate these round one wins. They're very, very important come the end of the year. Brisbane then played Port on Saturday night, and this was a game I was hyping up as a you know, potential grand final preview. I think that's fair to say. Both of these teams uh, seem to be in the thick of it. Uh, but in terms of the standard, it was probably one of the lowest standard games I'd watched up until that point of the round. Uh, I think you have to put a bit of that down to the conditions in Queensland. So let's not be unfair on these two teams. I'm sure they're going to be both very, very good. But it was hard to watch at times, particularly with some of the basic skill errors executed in the last, you know, stage of the game. Some of that's fatigue. Some of that's the due. And ultimately, it was a horrible game for Port Adelaide from the injury standpoint. I think Dersma had a collar bone issue. Not sure what the latest is on that, but it's probably not good news. Port Adelaide looked the better team for large periods of that game, but Brisbane ultimately just uh, outran them in the end and had a bit more in the tank. So again, another eight point game, but I think from Port Adelaide's perspective, I think they'll be relatively okay with the result considering all the injury adversity they had. Plus, you know, beating the Lions at the Gabba is, is tough work. So I'll be interested to see how they go next week in, you know, maybe better conditions playing at home. But as a spectacle, that game was uh, a little underwhelming. Shout out to Dan Houston though, probably got to be the best game of his career and he looked dangerous from uh, beyond the arc as well. He had a couple of goals as well. So if he's a player that takes his game to the next level this year, which, you know, that's a pretty good start, Port Adelaide definitely have a lot of upside, as do Brisbane. Hawthorne, North Melbourne, I, I didn't really catch too much of the Sunday games, unfortunately, uh, considering they involved my teams as well. But uh, I tipped Hawthorne, they got the job done. From the looks of things, Sicily had a pretty good return game and uh, it would have been nice to notch the four points in Sam Mitchell's first game as head coach. I don't really have too much for you on this game because as I said didn't watch it but uh, from a statistical point of view you'd be happy with uh, someone like LDU bobbing up for 27 touches as well so he's a player that if he becomes consistent I think could be a uh, future A grader of the comp so all in all this game pretty much went uh, how I expect it to go I don't know how much we really learned from that game Second last game of the round was Adelaide versus Fremantle and uh, I did my best to catch this game in flashes. I was kind of following the score and obviously Fremantle got out to that massive lead which evaporated in the space of a quarter. So a very strange game and I don't know, it must have been fairly entertaining for the neutral fan. Certainly one of the most exciting finishes to a game I've ever seen. I did manage to uh, hop in my car and chuck on KO for the dying minutes and that last, last kick with about five seconds to go that Heath Chapman managed to keep in play. 
heroic effort from his perspective and uh, agonizingly close for the Crows. Looking at that performance though, I think the Crows can probably be slightly satisfied with that result. They're a young team, the expectations are low, and I know Fremantle fans are buzzing right now, haven't really come down from cloud nine since they uh, won the first Amy community game against West Coast. No, but in all seriousness, I, th I think Fremantle fans were probably a little bit flat. Uh, you know, to concede the way they did in that third term would be a little bit of a question mark, but ultimately they had a few injuries, Fife, Mundy and Sean Darcy, arguably three of the more important players. So to get the four points, I think they can just sort of shake that one off and uh, and move on. But what a debut from Josh Rochelle. I didn't catch all of the game, like I said, to kick five goals in that fashion. Uh, we've got a serious player on our hands. Finally, final game of the round, unfortunately couldn't be in attendance to West Coast versus Gold Coast. Um, this is a game where, you know, the, the injury issues are well documented at West Coast. So I did tip us in my predictions video at the start of the week, but I think at that point I expected Shuey to play. I think I was hoping Kelly would play and I didn't even know about Liam Ryan. So with those three out, I did quickly change my tip for the Gold Coast Suns. And honestly, to, to only lose by four goals and honestly the, the score kind of blew out in the last five minutes or so, there's a bit to like about it. I actually thought from what I saw, and I probably caught about a quarter and a half of the game all up, watched the highlights, read some analysis. There's a bit of spunk about this Eagles team. I know that's such an absurd observation to make after, you know, our first ever loss at home to the Gold Coast Suns, but I think it was like 12 of our best 18 were out. Um, five of our starting eight midfielders were out. So there was fears this game could get really ugly, but what I'm looking for is system, approach, aggression, um, and the way they took the game on and yeah, plenty to like. So I'm actually pretty satisfied with that. And going into next round with a few key ins, I, you got to give us a chance. I thought we played pretty well. The ball movement was solid, the skills were good, um, and the tenacity was there. But I think when I was watching it in the second term, when we got a few goals, I was looking and the, the boys' hair was all sopping wet. They looked absolutely gassed, and I, I was pretty confident then. There was no way we were going to run out four quarters. So if it was close in the last term... I knew the Gold Coast Suns would run away, and that's exactly what happened. Not to make it all about the Eagles, though, uh, from a Gold Coast perspective, they have their own injury woes, particularly in the forward half with Ben King not available. I think there was a big question mark about how they were going to score goals. I kind of felt that their young midfield was going to bully the Eagles, and, you know, Rao had a really good game. Took Miller was inspirational. Isaac Rankin, four goals, 23 touches. So there's a lot to like about that Gold Coast side. I knew they were going to be dangerous early in the season as well, and ultimately just had a bit more run, and I think it's fair to say just... They're arguably a more, you know, hardened and experienced side, particularly in that midfield, even though they're just about 21 year olds. A couple of number two draft picks in that team and number one draft pick. And I think Took Miller himself was a first round draft pick not that long ago. Not surprised at all. And I don't want to write off this Gold Coast uh, victory as meaningless. It was uh, certainly a good performance from them. For them, the test now will be carrying their early season form later in the year. So there's still a wait and see for me, but... All in all, I think both teams walk away from that fairly satisfied. All right, guys, that was my crack at a round one wrap. Let me know in the comments uh, what you agree with, what you disagree with, maybe fill in some blanks. What were some takeaways uh, from this round that you think I missed or, you know, especially from the games that I uh, blatantly didn't watch. But as always, guys, I appreciate the support. Uh, hope you're enjoying the content and uh, yeah, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.